that uh, for that part. I really see a raised hand. Can you check on who, who raised the hand, uh, Marjolke? Minnequist. Maybe you can, Minneke, uh, if there's a question you want yeah. to ask, maybe you can put it on the on the on the chat. Well, yeah, indeed, that's the best thing to do, I think. Yeah. Or it's it's uh, not on purpose, the hand. That's also possible. That's yeah. also possible. <laughs> yeah, it is a good way to raise attention. That uh, Zoom allows you to uh, to raise your hand, and uh, um, as we said, the, the main the most of the interaction will actually be um, via the chat, as we have a larger group. So uh, you can't see all the people uh, who are present. You can see on the list of participants who are present. And we, we like this to be as interactive as, as, as possible. And therefore we have to have the chat uh, function. Uh, so any comments or introductions? Uh, I really would like to see from people who they are. I have seen a comment now from Shuna Venner to all panelists. Nice. I'm Shuna. Um, and you issued it to all panelists, but maybe you can also, I think you can also actually send a message to all attendees, can't you, Marjonneke? Yes, you can, you can. Yeah, so maybe yeah. Shuna, you can send a message again to all attendees, uh, panelists and attendees, then it will reach all the, all the, all the persons. But the message was, I'm Shuna, a clinical nurse specialist working in Netherlands on an open ward, and as an advisor focusing on learning in the broadest sense of the word, word and that indeed we yeah. know of you. So thank you for being here, Shuna. But can you find, uh, because indeed I did the same, I'm aware now. No, yeah, because it's a need to, to all panelists and attendees. So if you click on the button in the chat, yeah. you have a blue bar, you yeah. can check uh, or all panelists or all panelists and attendees. So then you can send it to all. Yeah. And I gave, in fact, the wrong example by. Yeah. by uh, it's all trial and error. It's we're, all, we're all learning. Uh, yes. Copy past, apparently. Um, it's now 5 2, so maybe we should start with uh, uh, the musicians yep. from the Our Ladies Grammar School. Uh, can you unmute yourself and uh, introduce, introduce yourself and what you're going to play? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so, hello from Our Ladies Grammar School in Uri. And um, we're absolutely delighted to be playing for you today at the International Mental Health Webinar. My name is Annie Smith, and I'm joined by Aoife Smith, my sister on Ellen Pipes, our friend Brenna Byrne on the harp, and our teacher, Mrs. Rosie Smith. So, um, we are members of our school traditional group called Plerica. And Plerica means good fun, and that's something that we associate with music. Okay, music's good for the soul, and we hope that today we will be able to lift some of your spirits as it does for us. So we'll start with an Irish song called Mahill, and we will follow that by a polka. So thank you, and we hope you enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
last man over the border, and we'll follow that with a reading called The Road to Town. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Mr McAllister for giving us the opportunity to play here today. It's been an absolute honour. And also to our principal, Mrs McLinden, for facilitating it. We hope that you have enjoyed it, and we hope that this has lifted your spirits. So thanks again. <laughs> Wow. Applause for you. Thank you so much. It was really beautiful. We couldn't wish a better start to this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Rosie Smith uh, from Our Ladies Burma School in Newry uh, with her pupils, uh, Brenna Byrne, who is uh, doing the harp, if I'm right, because yeah, uh, Annie Smith on the fiddle and uh, Eva Smith on the pipe. So thank you so much and uh, doing great. Thanks. Um, I would like to uh, uh, start the webinar. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody uh, to uh, the second in series of webinars organized by the Dutch International Mental Health Hub, this time uh, organized together with UCOMS, uh, the European Community Mental Health Service Providers Network. Um, and uh, today uh, we will provide an international perspective on the use of a public mental health approach to contribute to community recovery and a meaningful uh, peace process. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining all. Um, before we start, I would like to go through some practical points uh, for you to participate uh, in this webinar, because um, the interaction is what it makes it nice. Uh, first of all, you can use uh, the chat box, like Renee said earlier, to share your comments, questions, but also to, for, to connect uh, with the other participants if you want to share information. Uh, during the Q&A, which is in the end of the webinar, you can use the raise hand icon uh, to uh, ask your question. Uh, if we have time for live questions, because during the webinar, we would like to invite you to uh, type in your question in the Q&A box. Uh, and uh, people also have the opportunity here to rate the questions and the most rated questions we will address uh, in the Q&A section. 
Um, and if there's time for live questions, of course, raise your hand. If you have any technical problems, please uh, call Marius Peterson, uh, who is the uh, UCOM, yeah, who is responsible for UCOM Secretariat and uh, the technical organization of this webinar. Uh, you can also email him. And indeed, what Rene said earlier, I would like to uh, say to you that this webinar is recorded. So if you don't want to be on screen, let us know in the Q and A box so that we don't uh, share the screen. We just ask your question that you've written down. So today we will go uh, into the question, how can a public mental health approach help contribute to community recovery and a meaningful peace process? Um, and we mostly uh, use the, uh, we go into this with Peter McBride, uh, who will use the troubles as a case in this. But we start with uh, Renee Kate, who's the chair of UCOMS network uh, and also the host of today. And Uda Huilund, uh, who is peer expert and sociologist uh, from Oslo, Norway. Uh, after that, René will go into the six principles of community mental health connected to the vision of UCOMS. Uh, then Peter McBride uh, will uh, uh, do his keynote presentation on public mental health as a contribution to a meaningful peace process. He is the director of the Cohen uh, Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies in the United States. This will be followed by an interview of Jak Jacobine Geel, who is the chair of the Dutch, Dutch Association for Mental Health and Addiction Care, uh, with Annelieke Drogendijk, who is the director of uh, the ARC International Center uh, and the ARC Center of Expertise on War, Persecution and Violence in the Netherlands. And they will make the connection to the Dutch practice. After that, René, Kate, the host of today, and Uda, who is the commentary of today, will provide their reflection. And then we have a nice musical break uh, with Whiskey Mick, uh, a Camden, local Camden uh, musician, and he will do his live music act with a song related to the troubles. Um, and then we have time for a Q&A, which I hope is going to be very nice and interactive. And then we will close off uh, René, Uda and me with some closing remarks. So I would like to give the screen now to Renee, Kate, uh, who and Uda Hoyland, who are welcome you to this webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Marjanneke, for uh, for introducing uh, this. Welcome, everybody. Really great to see you. People from different uh, countries. And the UCOM Center for Community Mental Health Service Providers, um, but we also stand for community learning. So we also like to see this, uh, this webinar together uh, as the start of a community of people who are devoted to the topic of public mental health and also how the topic can uh, help bring peace. And we like to think of uh, how we can learn from the experience in Northern Ireland. Um, but also translate it to the situation uh, in our own country or in our own countries, because our people from different countries present uh, in this in this uh, webinar. So it's a meeting to learn uh, from each other. And the, maybe one of the fundamental principles of UCOMS on community mental health is that mental health service provider is a process of co-creation um, of professionals and users of that service. And to uh, but to really to practice what we preach. We always start our meetings um, with an opening by a peer expert, in this case of Uda Hoylund uh, from Oslo, who is also in the, in the board of UCOMS. So Uda, I'd like to give you the floor. Thank you, Renee. Um, and thank you for having me and for the beautiful music that opened this webinar. That was really beautiful. Um, I'm just going to throw out some thoughts that I have from my perspective as a peer expert and some questions that maybe we can think about today. So when I saw the theme of this webinar, uh, an international perspective on public mental health as a contribution to community recovery and a meaningful peace process. What I thought about is the term post-traumatic growth. And I was thinking whether maybe some of the elements from uh, post-traumatic growth on an individual level can be useful on a community level. So um, my work is mainly as a peer expert and I have some experience with trauma on, on an individual level. And I also have some experience with recovering and thriving. 
Um, and when I use the term post-traumatic growth, as maybe a lot of you know, but I can I can still <laughs> maybe uh, get the diff definition right. Um, it's positive change that comes as a result of surviving trauma. So that means that it's possible to experience, among other things, a new appreciation of life and a deeper connection with others and a newfound meaning after surviving something traumatic. And for me, um, to get to this place, to achieve post-traumatic growth, some of the most important things for me was uh, accepting what had happened to me and being allowed to express how I felt, but also finding a sense of community with other people who had similar experiences or who had survived and could meet me with compassion. And then another thing that was really important was having the space to rebuild an identity. So uh, of course, to achieve these things, you need support and you need to be able to uh, have a safe space to share your experiences and you need someone to give you hope that things are going to get better. So I'm wondering how can we translate these aspects to the community level? I have a lot of questions that I'm asking myself today. Maybe uh, you have all the answers, but maybe if you don't, maybe we can find the answers together. Uh, but some of the questions are, um, how can we achieve post-traumatic growth and healing for larger parts of the population? How can public mental health services support not only individuals that have experienced trauma, but the, the, how can we support the diverse communities that we are a part of? And how can we integrate what we know helps, help, helps people on a personal level so that we develop communities that benefits us on a population level. And I want you to listen for these things today. That was a lot of questions, but maybe <laughs> you can uh, remember some of it and take it with you when we listen to the keynote speakers and the interview. And I want you to remember that we're not when we're surviving trauma or rebuilding a community, we're not going back to what we had. We are moving forwards. So we are building a new identity and a new community. And there's a lot of possibilities and hope in that. So I'm excited to follow the program today. Um, I hope I can be of some use in the Q&A and in the commentary. And I think this is just so, such an exciting topic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Uda, for this uh, great uh, in introduction. Uh, also, welcome Jacobine Gill, who has entered uh, the panel. Great to have you here, as you will later do the interview with uh, Annelieke Drogendijk. I'd like now to, for those who are not uh, familiar with it, to very briefly present indeed on the six principles of community mental health. And so if um, Jonneke or Marius can start the slide. Uh, when we started this network of community mental health services, um, it was really something that we um, that we started with the idea, we must build a network and we must really define what good community mental health care looks like. Uh, but mm, we then we quickly changed it into more defining the underlying principles of community mental health. Why do we do it? And uh, to stimulate each other to build within your region, your country, uh, your service, uh, a, a service that meets these six principles. And uh, there will be one by one. The first principle is that of human rights. And in fact, to show that this is, has been on the agenda already from the 60s onwards, I show you the cover of this book, Asylums, uh, where these institutions that were really built with good intentions, in fact, became places place of violation of human rights. But human rights is a broader topic than freedom. It's also about right to, to healthcare, right to, uh, to having a house, right to having a job. So then those aspects of care, become uh, something that you really must must organize. And then the, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is for us a leading document. The second principle, and we show it with, with showing a map, this case a map of Malaga, where we once met, 
But the idea is that you have an, a region in which your mental health service works, and then you have a responsibility for the well-being of all um, people who live in that catchment area. Uh, so this, in fact, is a way to express the importance of a public health uh, approach, which will be, in fact, the central topic of our talk today. So we translate trauma at an individual level, as Ulla said, to that at a population level. And uh, Peter McBride will show lessons learned from the situation in Northern Ireland. The third principle um, in this case is showed by a, by a road, or like in the Beatles song, a long and winding road, that expresses the recovery journey. And recovery, of course, started as a citizen right movement of people no longer accepting that there are citizens with less rights than other. And this whole movement uh, started uh, with people telling their recovery stories. And for example, we learned something that Uda also expressed, the importance of giving hope and of the direct support that you have from your environment. In fact, those things often turn out to be much more important than the professional help that we organize. So that means that we should base ourselves on the, the goals and the talents and the strengths. The fourth principle, um, and we show it by a picture of oil and vinegar, that in fact is about evidence-based medicine. And we think that goes together very well with the recovery principle. Sometimes people see these as sort of contradicting principles, but they are not. Both are about patient values and how you organize it. The, the fifth principle, uh, here you see a beehive in fact to express the importance of a network. Uh, mental well-being is too big a topic for mental health care providers alone. You need to work in a larger uh, community network. And then it's really helpful that you organize yourself as a network too. And then sixth principle, um, we're, we're glad that we have someone from Japan in this webinar because this is an, 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 uh, an illustration that comes from Japan. There's a Japanese tradition, I hope I pronounced it right, Kintsugoroi, which is when pottery is broken, it's repaired with gold. And I think that's a beautiful image of what peer expertise is about. Something went wrong, something was broken, but in the repair process, you still see the crack, it's not hidden, uh, but in the repair process, you can add value. So that's for us the expression of how important peer expertise is. And this is not only for the peer expert in a service, but it's also an invitation to professionals to be more open about their own uh, lived experience, as we say. So this is a very brief recap of what the, the, the principles of community mental health service are about. And so today we really focus on that second principle, the, the public health, and uh, especially in the public mental health based upon the experience in Northern Ireland. And so I'm really honored to give the floor to an expert on this field, uh, Peter McBride. Peter. Uh, Rene, thank you very, thank you very, very much indeed. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I'll, let me just share my screen with you so that you can, uh, you can see. Um, you can hear from my accent, even though I'm, I'm introduced as the director of the Cohen Centre, uh, which is based in New Hampshire. I, I come from Northern Ireland and it might be slightly misleading in the sense that I've just taken up this role in the States. In fact, I'm still here in Northern Ireland. I was, I was um, banned from entering the States uh, by presidential decree. Um, so I've been waiting to get my visa approved and just heard last week. So my wife and I are heading across there uh, next Friday, but I've been, I started work at the beginning of July. But for the last 20 years prior to that, I had worked in Northern Ireland uh, in community-based mental health services and had the privilege of working with Rene in the early days of UCOMS. In fact, the first UCOMS conference was in Northern Ireland on this very subject. So I was really honored to be asked to do this, and it's a subject that is extremely close to my heart. And I hope that you will see from what I talk about today, the link between what I'm describing historically in Northern Ireland and, and my new role in terms of Holocaust and genocide studies, looking at the whole issue of how atrocity affects populations. What I'd like to cover, and I, I thought Oda's uh, introduction was brilliant. Uh, she's covered really nicely, set this up nicely for me. What I'd like to, to cover in my presentation is a brief overview of the experience of trauma, uh, just so that we understand the symptom clusters associated with it. And that's historically, that's been understood as an individual experience. 
I want to move that quickly on then to looking at how it's possible to understand those experiences uh, in large groups, in communities, in whole societies, uh, and to use Northern Ireland as an example of this. And then to finish up by, by saying what that means for the provision of services and how we might go forward with some compassionate hope for the future. Um, so, uh, so that will be the sequence that, that I'll cover um, during the, the day. Uh, see. So trauma is not a, a new idea. Uh, trauma is a Greek word. It goes back into Greek mythology. There are stories of warriors uh, who, uh, after battles, were not for, for many months or years, were unable to sleep or were deeply affected by the images that they saw or the experiences that they had. So this is not a, it is not a new phenomenon. Uh, it goes back to early psychoanalysis where um, Sigmund Freud uh, made a link between the trauma of childhood sexual abuse and the adult experience of mental illness. Many people at the time interestingly dismissed that idea uh, and they dismissed it because they couldn't believe that enough children would be sexually abused to explain the level of mental illness in adulthood. And sadly, we know now um, that actually the, there is a very significant link and the numbers are extremely high. When we think about trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder, we often think of the First or Second World Wars, First World War where it was thought of as shell shock, where it was thought of as something physical um, from the repercussions of, of bombs going off. World War II became slightly more sophisticated in understanding it as battle fatigue or war neurosis, where it began to be understood as a, as a psychological syndrome. And it really came to uh, clarity in the Vietnam War, uh, where there was the initial diagnosis and recognition of a condition called post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Uh, where it became a very distinct diagnostic entity, and that was around 1980. Um, and uh, and, and the, what drove that actually at the time post-Vietnam uh, War was the issue of compensation and trying to find a way of putting a measure on the psychological damage that was done to veterans who were returning from war. From 1980, um, the idea of trauma has been popularized and spread because up until that point, it was very much seen as a military experience. It was something that individuals, mostly men actually, who were involved in war would experience. In the 1980s and 90s, the feminist movement uh, helped us understand it in a much more broad way, where we began to understand, recognize the equivalent psychological trauma of rape, domestic violence and childhood abuse. Uh, and that became equivalent with war. So what happened was it got taken out of this very specific military context and began to be understood in a, in a much more generic context. Uh, one of the challenges I think that we've had with this is that the diagnostic criteria associated with PTSD are very specific. And so in a way, trauma up until now has been thought of as a very specific mental illness. What I'd like to talk about today is how we might broaden out this idea of the impact of trauma beyond the very specific diagnosis associated with PTSD and to look at it in much more broadly in terms of how it affects how individuals see the world around them and how that, uh, what impact that has then on how communities understand themselves and how they engage in peace processes. Uh, because what we know now is my last point on this slide, which is there is increasing evidence to show that uh, adult experiences of mental illness are often associated with childhood experiences of trauma or, or previous experiences of trauma. And the language that's used in this is variable. We talk about adverse childhood experiences, trauma, abuse, or, there are lo there's lots of language. For me, the fundamental principle is that experiences that, that are experienced as traumatic um, have a profound effect on a person's life if left uncared for. Uh, and can and can deeply affect their psychological well-being being as they grow into adulthood. So what is it that makes an experience traumatic? It needs to be a threat. Uh, so physical safety is the obvious threat. It needs to be something that nearly happened or that uh, or, or perhaps that we witnessed happening someone that we love or it can be an existential threat. It can be something that uh, fundamentally challenges our sense of who we are. And so that allows us into the realm of, you know, uh, divorces, the breakdown of relationships, um, difficult experiences that we've had that have challenged our sense of ourselves. It needs to be extraordinary. It needs to be out of the ordinary world. It needs to be a challenge to our assumptive world. Our assumptive world is what allows us to get up in the morning and go out the door uh, because we assume that today will be like yesterday. Um, all of you are, are watching this seminar, you will know where the people that you love are, you'll know what they're doing, and you'll know that they're safe. But do you really? Uh, you're basing that on your experience to date. 
when when a trauma happens, when an airplane falls out of the sky, when a person gets hit by a car, or there's a car accident, or there's a terrible thing happens, it isn't expected, it isn't predicted, it has come out of the out of the ether and out of outside what is normal, and it's that that shatters our sense of uh, confidence in our ability to predict our own safety. It, it, it affects our ability to remain confident about going out the door and know that we are going to be okay, or indeed to allow our children out of the door and know that they are going to be okay. So it has to be this challenge to our assumptive world and outside of our, our personal norms. And it needs to evoke an overwhelming emotional response. This isn't always apparent. For some people, uh, through a process of dissociation, they are able to kind of manage their response by not feeling anything. Uh, but it's not that it isn't having an impact, it's that the response is so overwhelming that people can't allow themselves to experience it. And this is, I suppose, where the variability of trauma reaction comes in. So two people can go through a similar experience, one can experience it as traumatic, and the other will just experience it as very distressing. And that's based on the, the levels of personal resilience, and, and there are lots of factors associated with that. So, um, so so what I'm saying is that trauma is more than simply these war experiences. The experience of trauma can go right through all of the, the various colors of life, all the various aspects associated with life. It affects our, it is not just a psychological Im impact in the sense that um, for people who are struggling with long-term traumatic effects, um, it affects the, the physiology of their brain and it affects how they experience the world. For example, the amygdala, which is responsible for the fight or flight uh, uh, response um, gets bigger, it becomes more active because it's active all the time. So what does this mean? There are three main symptom cl clusters associated with trauma uh, that I think are relevant when we start to think of communities. So if you think of individuals to start with, the primary symptoms associated with trauma, which I think drive all the others, is this process of compromised memory creation. So Whenever a, a terrible thing happens or a bad thing happens to us uh, in the normal scope of life, and I use normal very guardedly there, but in the ordinary scope of life, we experience bad things all the time. You know, li life is full of suffering and, and, and things happen, but we get over it. My, my father died a year ago. Uh, my mother had died six or seven years prior to that. I was very upset when my father died and um, we went through the funeral. But as the weeks and months went on, uh, I, be I began to not feel it so acutely. I began to be able to remember him without getting upset. And I, can, and I can talk about it now quite easily without feeling myself overwhelmed because I have created a memory of my father that feels secure. And I don't feel the experience as, a, as an emotion. I, I, I've been able to calm the emotions down and turn that into a memory. What happens with a traumatic experience is that process is compromised. So if you, so typically, if you're talking with someone who's experienced a trauma, uh, they will be describing an event that has happened, and it might have happened a year, two years, five years, ten years before, but the way they will speak about it, it's as if it happened just yesterday. It's remained, it has remained alive with them. It's remained present because it hasn't been turned into a memory. It has remained physically and sensorily present and somatically present with them. And, and, the, and the mechanism that keeps that going are the mechanisms of flashbacks and re-experiencing the event rather than remembering it. And this is a really important distinction for people who are living with trauma. It's not that they just keep remembering what happened to them. It's more than that. It is that they keep re-experiencing what happened to them. And so they go through all of those emotional reactions every time that happens. And that re-experiencing is not predictable. It's not necessarily stimulated by some, an event that reminds them. It can just intrude in their consciousness at any given point in the day. Uh, and, and it is that principle that leads to the two um, subsequent sets of, of, of symptoms, which are, as a consequence of living like that, people are on constant psychological guard. They're, they're constantly emotionally aroused. And by that, I mean they're, they're, there's this sort of constant fight or flight arousal going on. Um, they're waiting for something bad to happen again. It is their bodies are in a state of tension and it's in that state of high alert waiting for something to happen. I've worked many years over my career with people in security forces as a consequence of the troubles here in Northern Ireland. And typically if I was meeting them out for a cup of coffee uh, and I was a little bit late and I walked into a coffee shop, I would always know where they'd be sitting uh, because they'd be sitting in the far corner facing the door. And why would they be sitting there? They'd be sitting there because they're on guard. They want to see who's coming in. Uh, they're not confident to have their back to the door. They want to be aware of their environment because they're constantly on guard. 
And that leads on to the third set of, of, of symptoms, which are avoidance, which is that, that as, a, um, as a consequence of that constant arousal, as a consequence of constantly being re-experiencing the event, people start to avoid things that they think will stimulate that. And so they pull away, they pull away from relationships, they pull away often from services that will support them, they pull away from their communities of support and sometimes from their families. And they do that to try and dampen down the stimulus. The problem with it is that it, all of those things are also their supports. And it is, it is all of those things that, that, uh, that potentially are there to help them heal, but that is compromised by their, uh, their instinct to pull away from it. So the world looks very different when viewed through the lens of trauma. When viewed through the lens of trauma, uh, the traumatic event is always present. It doesn't become a memory. Fear and the response to that event therefore is internalized and constant. So it is not that I am responding. If I'm, uh, when, when someone is living with trauma, they, their internal world is not congruent with what's going on outside them. So what's going on in the world around them may be calm, peaceful, uh, may have moved on. But what's going on internally for them because of the re-experiencing all the time is that, they, that, that the fear, the anxiety that they have felt as a consequence of that event that happened in the past remains with them and present as a present reality. And their body is responding to that all the time by maintaining a constant level of high alert. And their behavior then starts to adapt to accommodate that constant sense of fear. And then very importantly, that becomes the new normal. Uh, that becomes what normal life looks like. Now, what I wanna do now is take this and think about it in the community. So what happens when we start to think of trauma in community? So when there has been atrocity or genocide or violence perpetrated against whole societies, there, there are a number of factors to take into account. There will be within that society significant number of people who are directly affected by what happened, who, who would be seen as victims. And there will be a num significant number of people within that society who have got all those symptoms that I've just described of PTSD. But what also happens is the group identity of those societies starts to become trauma focused. Uh, the society starts to define itself in terms of what happened to it as a group uh, and this terrible atrocity or this terrible thing that was done to it. And that becomes one of the ways primarily that that society will start to understand its own identity and define itself. There will be subgroups within that society where specific traumas will happen and increase. And we've seen this, the evidence shows increases uh, in, in uh, violence against women, sexual violence against women, uh, violence against ch children, um, other forms of racism uh, or xenophobia within, within those societies where, uh, where they have experienced a, as a whole society, the experience of trauma. And the trauma narrative will then become embedded as a cultural identity. And then very importantly in this, uh, this doesn't go away with the next generation. You know, there's a fantasy around that all we need to do is wait. And with the next generation or the next generation, this will all sort of self out, doesn't happen. These communities close in on themselves and then the trauma gets transmitted both epigenetically, but also in terms of narrative, it gets transmitted to the children through parenting and through the children taking on uh, the mantle of carrying the trauma forward because the community is so deeply embedded and deeply associated with this trauma as, a con as part of the content of their identity. And the problem with this fundamentally when it comes to reconciliation is that that becomes a material obstacle because when, when people are confronted with the challenges of reconciliation, the, the, the very um, attitudes and, and characteristics that are required for reconciliation, the ability to compromise, the ability to put your empathize, to put yourself in the other's shoes, the ability to forgive, the ability to, you know, to work on these issues. Those are the very things that are compromised by the experience of trauma. The internalization of fear just does away with them all because uh, for a group that is living like this, they are deeply frightened and deeply anxious about any other anyone who is outside of their own group and therefore is presenting a threat. So if I, if, I, if I apply this to my experience here in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, for those of you who don't know, had 30 years of violence. Well, the truth is it had, it's had centuries of violence, you know, and if I go back to my point about how this operates transgenerationally, you can track the violence in Ireland back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, you can track genocide in Northern Ireland back to the famine. Uh, to, the, to the plantation, to the cleansing of, of Northern Ireland. So the, the story of Ireland is a story of atrocity, of genocide and trauma upon trauma upon trauma. The truth is, if we look at any of our countries, 
it's not hard to find that story in, in our history as well. But Ireland uh, is, is where I come from. About 4,000 people were killed over that time. Um, in, in terms of scale, that isn't a big number. Um, you know, in terms of other genocides or atrocities in the world, it isn't a big number. But because it was intractable violence over 30 years, um, it, was, it was significant because every single person in this country was affected by it. It was insidious. It wasn't clear who the enemy was. Uh, families or, or neighbors were murdering neighbors and it wasn't clear where the threat lay. So it meant that the whole of society was on that conflict footing. None of us quite knew what was gonna happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the Good Friday Agreement in 1999 uh, was brought the peace accord uh, and that was hailed throughout the world as one of the best examples of a reconciliation process that got us to a political settlement. Um, since then, so that's 20 years ago, uh, over the last 20 years, Northern Ireland has the highest rates of suicide in the UK, some of the highest in Europe, and going up. We have the highest rates of mental illness in the UK and going up. Uh, we have the highest rates of prescription psychiatric drug use in Europe. And we have some of the highest rates of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder in the world. So in terms of our, if the effectiveness in terms of public health or mental health, of peace coming to Northern Ireland has not been particularly effective. And I'm sad to say that a lot of the ethnic divisions have remained unchanged. We are still societally structurally divided, education, sport, health, and culture. There are two education systems, the, the school that, that played the music at the start. I, I immediately know that which side of the community that school was on, um, sport, different sports for both sides. All of society is on a conflict footing. With the threat of Brexit, there is an anxiety about a return to violence, and that is not a misplaced anxiety. It is quite possible. And actually, honestly, uh, while we have a form of peace, there is no resolution to the legacy issues of the past, uh, including how victims and survivors are dealt with. And this is an example. This is currently on the, the wall of a building in East Belfast, North Belfast, sorry, um, prepared for war, ready for peace. So look at that. Think of what that is saying. Uh, in terms of this idea of being on a conflict footing, ready for, uh, ready for violence to come. So one way of understanding this is that I've developed is to think of society in a post-conflict setting in, uh, in terms of three groups. Visible victims are the obvious group of people who get an awful lot of attention uh, in a post-conflict situation because they will be people in wheelchairs. They'll be people who have survived atrocities but, and who are very visibly traumatized both physically and mentally by those Second group are indirect victims who are not so visible, but have been nevertheless had a, are affected as a consequence of what happened. And the third group, in a way, is the is the rest of society, uh, and 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 I want to talk most about that. So I'll, I'll fly through the first two. Visible victims um, are highly visible in society. They will often have political collateral. They, they will be visible because of their injuries. There will be very high levels of post traumatic stress disorder and other psychological issues. They, are, they have all the credibility associated with being a visible victim. In other words, um, and, and in Northern Ireland, what that means is that they're often used for political means. Um, so politicians will wheel them out to remind other, the other side what they did and how they created victims. And that, what that does is it begins to create this idea of an elite and brings in the possibility of the idea of, a, of innocent victims and this conflict between the role of victims and the role of perpetrators. So what has happened in Northern Ireland is, is that after 20 years, we have not been able to resolve issues like compensation for victims because we cannot agree who the victims are because there's an argument about, for example, people who would have been involved in terrorism, who were um, shot by the security forces. So law and order um, uh, and intervening with people who were perceived as being, acting illegally. Are they victims or are they not? If they've survived, are they, are they, should they be included in people who are living as, as, uh, with the, the living reminder of what happened? The second group of hidden victims is slightly less clear. Um, and, and the issue with hidden victims is the issue of attribution. So when violence has become normalized, people will not see necessarily their adverse reactions to violence as something out of the ordinary or linked, or, or linked to trauma, for example. So what, when I gave you those statistics, people uh, living with mental illness, children and young people, high rates of uh, undiagnosed PTSD, very high rates of, of addiction, very high rates of drug and alcohol abuse, high rates of domestic and sexual violence, 
high rates of crime, but people don't necessarily say, you know, there's something going on here because we lived with violence for 30 years. The, the, the group of hidden victims, the issue for them is often being able to attribute some of these phenomenon to the consequence of, of what happened as a consequence of the violence over the years. And the last group that I want to talk about in more depth is the, the, the residual impact, the whole of society impact, uh, where this is affected by the numbers and the presence and the volume simply of victim survivors within society. Um, uh, the impact of, 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 on, the on the community of violence uh, by, by the indirect victims, indirect victims in it, and then the effectiveness of peace building and reconciliation uh, initiatives. So I want to look at this third group and go through the three symptoms cluster and just unpack this a little bit for you. So if you think of a whole society reacting to trauma, think of it in those three sets of symptoms that I described. The first one is this idea of compromised memory creation or people re-experiencing it. So what you have with a community is a community that keeps representing uh, the trauma that happened to it instead of memorializing it. Even though there are all these efforts to create memorials, what communities do who are traumatized is that they want to keep, they keep the uh, experience that they had real. So that the community memory of what happened is deeply informed by those individuals within that community who've been traumatized. Uh, and the community makes huge efforts to keep the memories alive rather than memorializing them. Um, and they do it through commemorations and anniversaries. So every year we go through, you know, different dates in the year, there will be, it will be a different anniversary, a different March. And each of these is provocative. Each of these often produces violence because it represents to the community and to the surrounding communities, the historical conflict that happened 20, 30 years ago. Um, political discourse, um, uh, justifying current policy and past events. So the political scenario in Northern Ireland was based on conflict. And we have you know, a political system that is split down the middle where the two sides that are represented politically now are the two sides who were fighting for 30 years since 1969, uh, 40 years since 1969. So, um, so it just reinforces the, 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 the differences. Uh, and what you get is conflicting as opposed to parallel historical narratives. In other words, we argue about what happened rather than accepting that people had different experiences through that time. Uh, and the media, the media sort of reinforces that. Uh, and what happens then is that that becomes embedded within our legislation. And you know, we, we protect division in schools. We protect all the rights of separation without reinforcing the need to, to move past that. In terms of hypervigilance, what that means for a community is this constant sense of the other as a threat. So the reason that levels of xenophobia and racism increase is that people have a heightened sense of the other as a threat to them. And political division, if, if a political system is based on that division, then it reinforces that. And what that creates is this exaggerated sense of belonging to our own community and a constant hypersensitivity, our ability to take offense. Uh, there's a funny story at the bottom there of a, a very well-known uh, uh, victims campaigner, Willie Fraser, who sadly has died uh, not too long ago. But he took great exception to a, a Catholic primary school um, flying a, what he thought was an Irish trickler. Actually, it was an Italian flag and they were doing a project on Italy. But he was, you know, there's a sense that people are just waiting to find offense. They're just waiting to be annoyed by something. Uh, and, and this is a, this, these are posters uh, that you find up around Belfast where on the left-hand side, it is a poster that is put up by um, Republican Catholic organizations uh, who, would, uh, who would argue that the British army and the British involvement in Northern Ireland has not gone away. Even after 20 years of peace, uh, they are still involved in our streets and they're still behind the scenes. But interestingly, on the right-hand side, you have a, a poster that uh, shows paramilitaries with a, a homemade mortar where the Protestant loyalists are saying exactly the same thing. Uh, the terrorists haven't gone away, you know, there's still a present sense of threat. And so what that leads to is this community avoidance. Uh, and this is one of the things that is most difficult for, uh, in terms of reconciliation processes, where rather than dealing with the past, which is required as part of a reconciliation process, uh, communities seek to reenact the past, to keep the present, to keep the conflict present. 
Uh, and that sense of community victimhood and the avoidance of community responsibility uh, becomes really difficult whenever you are asking a community to give up something of that historic trauma identity and move towards a much healthier identity that is able to embrace some of the complexities that reconciliation brings. Um, the constant search to apportion blame um, rather than being able to say, take responsibility on all sides. It is, it is very significant that, you know, that uh, you'll see it, you see it a little bit in America at the minute, it's not a little bit at all. This conflict between what is perceived to be law and order, which gets put in big capitals and people who are protesting. So that split where it's seen that, you know, one side is on the side of good and the other uh, law and order and the other must therefore be bad. Peter, I, I'm of, sorry to, to, inter yep. to interview, but you have one minute left. Yeah, I'm just about to finish. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that, ability, that need to apportion blame and reinforce the systems from the past. So I want to uh, I want to go finally to just what the interventions are that are that are appropriate for, at these levels. For direct victims, it's fairly obvious. It's not often done well, but it is obvious what needs to be done. Reparation, compensation, pensions for people whose lives have been completely disrupted by violence they've experienced, recognition that, that, that harm was done to them, and then specialist services, PTSD and other uh, medical treatments for them. For indirect victims, a little less clear, uh, high quality, easily accessible services, mental health services, et cetera. And, I, and I'm using a word in there, which, I, which I'll come on to in more detail, this idea of trauma-informed services. Um, whenever you grow up or you live in an environment where, it's, where violence is the norm, you don't realize, uh, living with that, you don't realize that what is being done to you is abnormal or that your reaction is abnormal. And so there's a huge need to inform a society and individuals in it about, the, 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 about where some of their symptoms are coming from, that it's not that they're bad people, it's not that they're weak people, but actually that they have experienced something that has compromised their normal coping strategies and, and, and has resulted in their feelings and behaviors uh, that they're experiencing. Interventions at community level for me are the most interesting and the most challenging. These are by nature more generic. At a public health level, for me, the aim is to increase trauma literacy. How do you get a society to begin to reflect on its experience of trauma, how, do, how it gets to reflect on some of the things that I've described where maybe the fear isn't real. Maybe the fear is, maybe the threat that we think exists doesn't really exist. Maybe it's based on our past experiences rather than our present reality. How do you get a society to begin to talk like that? Well, part of it is that you need to inform a society about the impact of trauma. So it's about trauma-informed health services beyond psychiatry, because this will affect people's physical health as well. It's about trauma-informed education. How do you get a dialogue in school where, where children begin to talk about the long-term impact of, of things that have happened within their society? Trauma-informed policing, very, very important. Uh, policing and criminal justice is a huge place where this needs to be thought through. Trauma-informed social work and community development. And also then the encouragement of the arts and creative industry because for much of this stuff, it can't be talked about straight on. It needs to be done in a creative an artistic way where people are able to access their emotions and their feelings about what has happened, as well as understand it intellectually. And lastly, in this to understand the transgenerational transmission of trauma. I, I, I want to finish with this slide and Oda mentioned this. It is very important to say this, that um, the reason I talk about this is not to get people anxious about it, but it is to offer hope that I absolutely believe that individuals and societies, when given the appropriate tools to support them, are able to work their way through this. There is hope. And there is the possibility for not just for individuals, but also for communities to have post-traumatic growth, that communities can find themselves strengthened, invigorated, uh, and moving on to a different place uh, if they are, are given the tools that will allow them uh, to deal with uh, trauma that they have experienced. I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit over time. I apologize. But I, I, I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this uh, fascinating uh, presentation. We hated to interrupt you. Uh, yes, it's, and I'm really glad that we have the recording, as your story is so uh, rich. Uh, we decided that the reflection of Uda will not be in this part. It will be in the second part with the Q&A. Okay. So very good reasons for all of you to really stay in the second part as well. But now I want to give the floor to uh, Jacobine Geel, and who will interview Annelieke uh, Drogendijk, in fact, on the relevance or the impact of your story for the situation in the Netherlands. Jacobine. 
Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacobine Geel. I'm uh, the chair of the Dutch Umbrella Organization for Mental Health Care Institutions, uh, the Nederlandse GGZ. And by background, I'm a theologian. And I think this background uh, makes me especially interested in this issue of uh, care for the individual that could also be transformed into care for the communities. So um, I listened with great, uh, great interest to your story, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now interview Annelieke Drogendijk, who is the director of ARC Center for Psychotrauma. So you work in the field of psychotrauma. Uh, and I assume that you work in this field uh, mainly on this individual level, that is the, the normal level where trauma is perceived. Am I correct, Annelieke? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for this very interesting uh, speech, a very inspiring speech indeed. Well, as a National Psychotrauma Center, uh, of course, we work a lot with uh, individual uh, trauma patients, uh, trauma people. But uh, as a director of the, uh, of the Center of Expertise, uh, we also do a lot of, uh, for more community-based uh, uh, interventions. And also uh, what we also do, especially uh, with disasters, but also the, the, the post-war and in our case, the post-World War II, which is uh, already a long time ago. We, uh, we also do things on, on more uh, societal and communal level. So we do it uh, on both. And I think uh, for me, it was also within the organization with also all our, our, my fantastic colleagues, which I also saw one is uh, in uh, our audience. They do a lot of good work, but I think, uh, and for me, that's a, one of uh, a big important thing. Uh, for example, if you have an affected community with affected uh, people, um, a lot of people have a lot of resilience and hope and they can go on. Uh, doing their things going on. And of course, with with uh, perspective of Peter said, with, with the intergenerational uh, narratives of trauma, but only a, a few percent or 10 percent, 10 or 5 to 10 percent, they will come in the individual healthcare. Um, and for me, it's so important uh, that if you're treating people or if people are recovering themselves, they do it all, always in a context. So they do it in the context of the family. Is your trauma being recognized by your family members? But they also do it in the context of the of the uh, the community and also in the society. And we see with a lot of uh, and also what Peter said with a lot of affected uh, groups of people. Um, for example, you saw it with the Vietnam veterans, and we have also every country have their veterans with with a with a mission gone wrong, you know. And when they come back and every and the whole country and uh, is is looking at them that they were uh, that the, that the mission went wrong or that they did something what what was not uh, right. Um, you can treat people, but when they come home and they go into a little birthday party and every says, "Oh, you're uh, one of them," or the, when they put on the paper and see another or put on the television and see another. Uh, yeah, uh, a documentary or a thing. It's it's so hard to treat people, and especially treat the people uh, with uh, with a traumatic uh, thing. So it's I think it's it's always in this context. Mm -hmm. So therefore, maybe to, to 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 create a bridge between the story of Peter and your own experience, also on the, on the, the group and the community level. Um, was there something in his words that struck you as an eye opener with which you think this could be added to uh, to our work here in the Netherlands? Well, I think one of the eye openers for me was uh, in the Netherlands, um, we always see commemoration as a part of the recovery story. For example, we have our big national commemorations of the, the uh, Second World War and, and it was a bottom up uh, commemoration. So it was uh, built uh, from the public. Um, and there is also always, uh, uh, during all the, 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 the years, there was a, a big discussion about who are we commemorating, and it still is. But as uh, Peter said, uh, which is another way, 
And he says, and which is really think, okay, I really have to think about it. He says, a commemoration is, uh, you know, a fixing the, uh, the narrative uh, of, the, of the victim. And I think that is the problem, you know, are you talking about affected people by war or are you talking about victims of war? And victims is a con uh, yeah, uh, is an is is an is an uh, content loaded uh, term, you know. And I think that is really a thing about, uh, for example, uh, in the Netherlands, we are a quite stable uh, community, uh, community in peace for uh, uh, yeah, seventy five years. And of course, uh, Peter is, is talking about uh, uh, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a holiday country for, the, for most people of the Netherlands and for most people for Europe. And it's so close by and it's so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm always um, struck by the, yeah, by the impact of all these years of troubles. And as Peter said, all the years of, of yeah, of, of the troubles and the wars and everything. So I think, um, yeah, for me, that was a point uh, which really, uh, uh, when when you're thinking about commemorations, in uh, we see it as a positive thing. Eh? Yeah, we, we see, see it, it as a way positive of honoring thing. the past and honoring the people who, who, who stood up. Uh, but Peter sketches it more like something to to keep the trauma alive in a way. Yeah. Yeah? Be That's aware a of it. Very different way of, of viewing it. Yeah. Yeah. And then can you imagine fun. groups uh, in the Netherlands with which you work where this commemoration would have the same uh, trauma reinforcing effect where you never thought about it in that way? Well, of course, we have uh, uh, some, um, yeah, in, in, I think in the Netherlands, it's both sides. Uh, for example, um, you have some commemorations, of course, of, of the, the the war in the, the 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 Second World War in the East Indies, uh, the the formerly Dutch East Indies, now of course uh, Indonesia, um, and uh, at this at it's it's you know it's it's like both ways uh, having this commemoration. They want to show and have the recognition, for example, that uh, they also had a war on the other side of the world. Um, uh, on the other hand, it, it's a bit of a of a problem because, for example, our king uh, and the the uh, he only uh, speaks on this commemorations one in the five years, and every year he doesn't come for the for the people of the of the yeah the, the formerly Dutch East Indies. It's really a troubled thing because they don't feel recognized because on the national uh, commemoration, uh, the king is always present. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's both ways. Can I can I make perhaps uh, well it's 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 a little bit risky to to make the comparison, but uh, trauma is something of an exceptional experience, an exceptional proportion, uh, also when it affects communities. Um, is there, is it, is it relevant to look at our nation at this moment and maybe many other nations who have been in lockdown, which was in a way very much out of the ordinary, that, that it, it has some traumatizing effects, maybe not the trauma that is Northern Ireland or anything else, but the traumatizing effect, which could be helped by any of the interventions Peter sketched. Do you understand my question? Yeah, I understand it. This, this healing the community, I think it's a very interesting part of the speech. Uh, uh, it, it gives us a, a, a tools, perhaps, to, to look at our, well, in a way, also a little bit wounded society, or at least a little bit out of balance. Yeah, so and corona, I, I, lockdown. Yeah, yeah, I understand it. And especially when you look at the groups, uh, uh, the Dutch of the, the mental health services, uh, its groups, you know, I, I checked uh, in, for this uh, webinar, I checked the, the website and I saw that the mission of the association of the, the Dutch mental health services is, a, is the dream of a country where nobody feels lonely or desperate. And I think it was spot on because when we are looking at Corona, I think especially the groups, uh, your patients, your ex-patients, the, the clients, the ex-clients, 
Um, I think they are hit with Corona maybe um, ex more than other people, of course. Um, and I think we don't know. And that's what is my first thing. We really have to have research about it, you know. What is the effect of Corona on uh, people with, with severe mental health uh, problems? I think I'm sorry can... to interrupt, but we have uh, this. We're almost at two, so if you can uh, close off your answer. Uh, okay. Yeah, I will sorry. do it uh, fast. And I think what is the what is the impact of social distancing, you know, and 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 the economic uh, things. So I think I I feel here I feel a lot of uh, a lot of uh, points we have to take as uh, Dutch mental health uh, services. Uh, really to see and to look uh, to take care of, of the patients and the ex-patients. Um, and you could do it in several ways. You can do it in raising awareness, for example, uh, let the people who work with them speak up, let, let people themselves, for example, Odo with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with their uh, narratives of hope and, 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 and uh, post-traumatic growth, let them speak, but let them, let them also see to the big public uh, what is the impact for these groups, uh, for example, in Corona? I think it is the first step to recognition and to see uh, what's happening. But that's, I have a lot of more to say, but, you know, that's the time. Let's say that, that this approach has opened our eyes for also this uh, way of looking at where we are now in our own society. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you both for, for the interview and uh, all the interesting answers and these drawing a parallel to the Netherlands and other countries that maybe doesn't, don't have such a visible uh, history of conflict uh, and, and ways, we, ways to approach this and what we can do about it. Um, so now I have to share my screen. So uh, because we, for the people who cannot stay, uh, at the question and answer. I would like to say that we every three months we organize a webinar like this, where we show, we're going to an international perspective. So the next one is uh, on the 11th of December, and we will look at an international perspective on stigma within mental health care. Uh, and also UCOMS is organizing an event on the 17th of November, which is an international event where people can, uh, they can freely join, uh, I, I think, that's what I've heard. Uh, so please look on the website for the details. Uh, so see you soon if you're not joining and uh, the Q&A session. See you the next time. And before we go to the Q&A session, I would like to introduce Whiskey Mick, who is a local Camden musician uh, playing traditional Irish music. Uh, and he himself had a, a role in the Troubles. He was a British soldier uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, he will tell more about that in a movie we sent afterwards. Uh, and he will play some uh, music, a song, for us related to the to the troubles. So welcome Miss Kimik. Thank you very much. Uh, these are just two slightly truncated songs from two entirely different perspectives. Uh, the first one uh, is by Tommy Makem. It's called Four Green Fields. Uh, the four green fields of course being the provinces of Ulster, Munster, Leinster and Connaught. Did I have said the fine old woman? What did I have this proud old woman did say? I four green fields, each one was a jewel, but strangers came. Try to take them from me. I find strong sons who fought to save my jewels. They fought and they died, and that was my grief, said she. And what have I now? said the fine old. Proud old woman did say, I four green fields, 
And one of them's in bondage In stranger's hands That try to take it from me But my sons had sons As brave as were their fathers And my four green fields Were born once again, said she fourth green field will bloom once again said she this second song again is a, a little truncated but it's a song by Harvey Andrews uh, called the the British soldier soldier wished he was back home again come join the British army said the posters in his town come see the world and have your fun come serve before the crown the jobs were hard to come back and he couldn't face the door so he took his contrition and enlisted on the road a yell of fear a screech of brakes a shattering of glass. The window of the station broke to let the package pass. A scream came from the mothers as they ran towards the door, dragging children crying from a bomb upon the floor. The soldier moved towards the bomb, his stomach like a stone. Why was this his battle garden? Why was he alone? He lay down on the package and he murmured one farewell To those back home in England, to those he loved so well The crowd outside soon gathered as the ambulances came To carry off the body of a pawn lost to the game The crowd they clapped and jeered and they sang their rebel songs One soldier less to interfere where he did not belong. Thank you. Wow, beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your beautiful song. Um, and yeah, also uh, there's a move of you where you explain a bit more about your story, which we will send out to all participants uh, uh, after the webinar. Thank you. Many thanks. Whiskey Mick. Yes. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Whiskey Mick. Uh, great to, to have you with us. The, the healing force of music is uh, enormous and we want to show this aspect of culture as well. So really glad to, uh, to have you with us. And please stay around. Is there any question or comment? It is also very welcome. And as Marjolke said, you have your personal story that we really like to share with all the participants by sending it to them and putting it on our websites uh, together with this uh, recording so more people can enjoy it so thank you very much and um, so we come to, to the to the second part the q a and we still have 48 persons uh, with us so that's a good group for interaction and um i'd like to ask uh, marjonneke who uh, kept track of the of the chat and uh, and the q a um, what questions have come up that you want to address to, to us? Marjanneke. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the first question that came up was from uh, Birgit Gress from Germany. Uh, it's a question to Peter. And the question is, uh, do you know something about the consequences of the killing uh, of the psychiatric patients in the time of the German uh, nationalism? Uh, I'm thinking that this is a human and social trauma for the last century, not only in Germany, uh, and many lives in the background of our minds in society and pushes to uh, push the stigma of mental health. This is something maybe Peter can elaborate on, but maybe also Annelieke Drogendijk. Yeah, so first we start with Peter and then uh, we go on to Annelieke. Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a brilliant question, a really interesting idea. I mean, I, 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 people tend to think of the, when they think of the, 
genocide or the Holocaust of the Second World War, they tend to focus on the experience of Jewish people. And yet there are many people with disabilities, uh, uh, people, uh, Romani people, and also psychiatric patients who were also killed by the Nazis. Um, and it's interesting to think of that as having an impact. If you think of the community as being the psychiatric community, if you like, the community of people uh, with illness, then I'm sure that is a significant part of a, the sense of the, the sense of themselves uh, as being historically victimized in the true sense of that word, of the stigma and the shame and the and the lethal. Uh, force that was taken against people just simply because of their mental health. So I'm sure that I'm sure that that has something to do with it. And as part of it is the most extreme reflection of stigma and the fact that people can perceive those who are mentally ill, either with fear or certainly uh, as worthy of being um, uh, part of the final solution. So I think I think I think it's a really interesting point. And on a broader issue, I would say, if you look around the world, you can see societies that have been hugely colored by historic trauma. You know, you could, I would argue that America is based, uh, and what we're seeing going on in America at the minute is based on two major atrocities. One is uh, the genocide of the native people uh, back at the foundation of the states. Uh, and the second is slavery. And those two huge atrocities are a huge part of what is going on at the minute uh, in the states. So the links that you're making, I think are exactly right. Thank you. Uh, Annelieke Terhoogenek. Uh, yeah, well, it's an interesting research at this moment. Uh, uh, it started uh, last year. It's in uh, a few of the Dutch uh, mental institutions or psychiatric uh, institutions. Um, the National Institute for Genocide Studies in the Netherlands, the NIOT uh, for the Dutch people, uh, they are doing a study right now and they had a preliminary study and it said that especially in the Netherlands, um, the the psychiatric uh, the psychiatric uh, patients, um, it, it was really a hardship for them because they were seen uh, by the Germans and by the Nazis, but also more or less uh, maybe in general that uh, there was less food during the hunger winter, so they had really a, a, a yeah, big uh, time, uh, and hard time, hard, hard uh, time ship. And I thought, uh, but you have to check uh, the results, that there was also a, a higher mortality uh, on the uh, psychiatric uh, patients, but they are doing the study right now, so it's a uh, it's preliminary study, I know. I can, uh, maybe I can uh, share the link uh, with you, uh, but I, I, I think it's only in Dutch, but I, I will uh, look it up for you. Thank you. That's great. If you can share that indeed. Uh, thank you for your answer. Um, is there any other panelists who would like to uh, address this or not? No? Okay. Uh, then there is a question, uh, or more like a remark of Stephen Watkins, uh, also about the presentation of Peter, uh, that uh, uh, yeah, that Ireland unfortunately invests relatively low levels of overall healthcare budget on mental health, and that this presentation would give a very strong case uh, for like, investing. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to say something about this. This is this is fairly typical of what happens in uh, post post-conflict countries. Uh, and it's a mixture of people, the effort that goes into bringing about peace. And then uh, when a society says that it wants to move on, um, there is a, a general kind of denial around the psychological impact of what has happened. So I have often done a presentation like I've done today and people will cynically say, so what you're saying, Peter, is that we're all traumatized. And, and it's as if that's a bad thing or it's as if uh, that somehow dismisses it at all. Um, so uh, Stephen is completely right. The health spending in Northern Ireland is lower than the rest of the UK. Uh, the provision of trauma services is less than the rest of the UK. Um, and it's be and, and uh, it, it is shocking when you think of after 40 years of violence um, that that is the situation that we find ourselves in. And it's not just to do with there not being enough money. It is a political statement. It's a statement about how our politicians and how as a society, we want to brush this under the carpet and move forward because for a, for a government to recognize that their population has been damaged 
which I believe it has. So, uh, so government in recognizing that is under, is under responsibility then to do something about it. And, and I think that if you take away one point from all of, the, of what I was saying, you know, part of understanding trauma at a community level is about people understanding that all of us get damaged, but when violence hits a community and therefore all of us need to be part of the healing. Yeah, yeah thank you for the answer. Um, and then there was a f comment from Ian on this, like uh, he says, uh, when I did some work helping develop community support service in Northern Ireland, unfortunately, not, uh, unfortunately many people did not feel that psychiatry services were particularly helpful in supporting them. And then he goes on to say that indeed uh, we need to connect to communities with a public mental health approach. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. It's why I try, what I was trying to say at the start of my presentation was, it's not good enough to treat trauma as a, as a, as a sort of a pathology, as an individual um, experience, um, which is what psychiatric services tend to be modeled on. So, uh, you know, psychiatric services will deal with people who are ill, where there's a specific pathology and there's a specific, you know, route for treatment. And um, what I'm describing is something that goes way beyond that. And the public health approach is much more relevant to it and community-based services. And the, and the challenge with this is the people who are, who are in need of help will not necessarily identify themselves as traumatized. Hmm. You know, it's not a word that they will use. They will talk about their alcoholism or their, their drinking or their you know, self-medicating or their depression or whatever. And they hmm. won't necessarily identify themselves within this category of people who are traumatized but yet what their experience is has been profoundly affected by the experience of trauma so we need to be really creative about how we engage with this because it's not that's why i talked about trauma-informed art and creative industries um, because it's through those i mean i you you will all have heard whiskey mix uh songs differently to the way that i heard them they were incredible two very in incredibly political songs if you hear them from a and he knows i'm sure that's why he chose them um, it, when you hear it with a northern ireland eye, ear you hear what each and, and he very cleverly chose one from one side and one from the other mm -hmm. now you wouldn't hear that i hear it but it, it it is a very it's very important what music what the arts provoke in us that allows us to think about something differently which is much more profound than simply somebody telling us something or it being explained to us. Uh, and, and I think that when we're dealing with community-based trauma uh, and, and community interventions, we need to be really creative about how we get communities to think about themselves, how they think about the other, and how they, and how they think about what, you know, uh, about their experience as a group. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very inspiring answer as well. And we have to be more creative, basically. Uh, I saw Annelieke nodding. Uh, do you have anything to comment on this? Maybe what you see in the Netherlands or, yeah, in our context? Well, maybe I think maybe uh, I fully agree with Peter. It is you have to uh, uh, you have to think uh, in public awareness and also public awareness. And for example, uh, one context is really, uh, really older than another context. So it, it has to come from uh, inside. For example, I cannot make a public health program for, for Northern Ireland, for Ireland, because I would, it would be ridiculous, you know. But on the other hand, if you have uh, public awareness and if you tell the stories and if you have to tell the stories of the persons, and I think that's also a... Maybe a role for uh, for the mental or the, the mental health uh, institutions or, or organizations. Uh, for example, when I talk with my colleagues, my clinical colleagues uh, in the institution, they uh, can talk about um, a patient's journey, or they talk uh, can talk about their suffering or their recovery on a very elaborate way because I think they are used uh, to uh, talk about difficult problems. And make them. Uh, it's like they are they are making a painting, um, and they talk about it on the very. I can I can see the picture very clear, and I can feel the picture very clear. And I think that's really important when you have public awareness. And then maybe it's also a question uh, to all the the colleagues uh, in the mental health organizations. 
please do step up sometimes and uh, let uh, yeah tell your stories and of course with all the privacy and everything but i think it's so important uh, that you let you can um, let uh, the public feel uh, what you're seeing uh, in your uh, room uh, when you're uh, when you're treating your patient or treating your clients so I think uh, it's this is really uh, something you can use uh, in the public uh, awareness, uh, for example. Yeah, okay, thank you. Exactly. Also that, for example, uh, patients themselves or people who are experiencing trauma or problems that they share their stories or indeed in a creative way, maybe sing songs that they can let people feel uh, what they're going through. Like Peter said also... Uh, talks about the more the creative industry and that we have to be creative with that indeed. Um, thank you. Can we also uh, give people the opportunity to ask questions live, Marius, if they want to? Okay, I'll just ask the question. This was a question from Jan Bogaert. Um, inclusion of people with mental health issue or better the present prevention of exclusion from families, peer groups or society demands skills and attitudes in family members and mental health professionals. How would you describe these interaction skills? Who would like to comment on this? Rene, maybe you have uh, also as a, as a psychiatrist mm -hmm. from that point of view, or maybe Uda, or is the question not clear? I'm, I'm happy to say something about it. Maybe the others will will jump in. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think it's a it's a really interesting question because it it kind of it's based on the premise that service users and people who use services are the ones that need to change and adapt and learn and learn language. Where as I would say that in a in the way I see things developing, that responsibility primarily lies with professionals. In other words, the 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 way that services are designed and developed should primarily be within the kind of conceptual framework of service users and it is up to professionals to learn the language and and communicate in a way that that is easily understood by people who are using the service now that is not to say that there isn't a huge benefit if you take my phrase of trauma literacy um, that there isn't a huge benefit for us all including people who use services to become much more understanding of the impact that trauma has had on their mental health and are they're able to articulate that that would be a great thing but i really i would challenge us all to that that you know the the work that needs to be done is on the side of the systems to adapt and to learn so that they can so that we are able, so that we are able to communicate clearly and create create services that are easily accessible no thank you there's a lot I like to add. I like to add to that. Indeed, the importance one of the very important things that you can do in a public health level, from the point of view of mental health provider, is indeed what we call mental health uh, literacy. And this now has been really uh, very much focused, indeed, on on trauma uh, literacy. And I think that's a very important contribution, and it's a very important step. In just one example of, of I think, many ways that mental health services can become more public health. Um, or oriented and this fair there for me so inspiring the way that Peter connects the two. We have the possibility indeed of of person asking question live and as yeah. an example that Fran Silvestri is uh, with us and ask a question. Can you come okay. in uh, Fran? Okay. And uh, maybe in the meanwhile, as we wait for Fran, you can look up his question in case he does not appear that we have. Yeah, no, I have his question here indeed. Fran Silvestri is the, the CEO of the International In Initiative for Mental Health Leadership. Yeah. So I don't see his screen. So then, then maybe you can ask the question on his yeah. behalf, Marjonneke. Yes, of course. Um, now, his question was how to help mental health. Oh, yes. Uh, he's going to join in five seconds. Okay, perfect. Five seconds. Okay, then we can uh, wait. It's indeed nice so, if people can ask live their uh, questions as well. It makes it more uh, interactive. Yes. Can you hear me? You yes, we can hear you and see your picture. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Peter, congratulations that you're going to be able to join us in Keene, New Hampshire. We're thrilled to have you move into our community. And the question I had for you 
Um, also, first of all, to be able to, be able to understand that uh, two major um, traumas with both Native Americans and slavery is, is really important to understand. The question I had for you is that, how do you work with leaders in, in community organizations to understand what they need to do in order to be able to go beyond their bounds, like a mental health center, beyond mental health services? How do you help them collectively learn to work on, on the community so that they can deal with what's happened in a sort of reconciliation way? How would you do it? Thank, well, first of all, Fran, I'm really, I am really delighted to be joining you and Keen. Um, and uh, you, you know, you and I know each other from way back, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it very, very much. Brilliant question. I, I think that the challenge for me with this is how you make it inclusive. So, going back to my point at the start, that, that there's been a history of talking about trauma, which has been highly specialized, of very specialized treatments, very clear, uh, distinctive diagnoses and, and criteria for diagnosis. Uh, whereas what I think I'm describing is a much more generic experience and one which potentially is inclusive. So if you look at that definition of Northern Ireland, those three groups of you know, primary victims, secondary victims, and then the rest of society, I'm in that. I, I have been affected by the conflict. I wasn't directly traumatized. I, I wasn't even in the indirect group, but I, I'm certainly in that rest of society group. And, and therefore, when I talk about this, I'm not talking about something from a purely academic or um, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a kind of a practitioner point of view, I'm talking about this as part of the human condition. And so in the times that I have spoken to other leaders or other, other pr professionals in this, what I start by trying to do is trying to get all of us to connect with our experience of trauma. Because I would argue that most of us have experienced it in some shape or form, not necessarily at a clinical level that requires intervention or that's provoked PTSD, but most of us can, ex can understand what I'm talking about based on our own experience. And building on that, when we start then to think about trauma-informed practice, it's people starting to say, right, if, if, that is what, if that's what trauma does, if trauma changes the way you see the world, if it affects this kind of experience of fear that I, you know, I feel anxious and frightened, but I don't know why. Well, maybe it's got to do with experiences that I've had in the past that this reminds me of or whatever. And it allows people to make those kind of connections and start to intelligently interpret their experience through a different lens where they will question their emotional responses to things rather than just accept that as real. Uh, and, and, and I think that in doing that, it's not, and, that, and that's why I think it's so important that we get other people. So we need educationalists involved to help us understand what does this look like in education and in schools? We need, we need musicians involved like Whiskey Mick. We need, we need people from the arts involved. We need people from criminal justice involved to say, you know, you, we potentially, in the States, you have a traumatized workforce uh, in the police trying to police traumatized communities. So the police are on edge because they're traumatized and they're, they're seeing threat and, and, and risk around every corner. And communities are traumatized and are seeing everything the police do, does as an attack. So it's a recipe for disaster. And we're seeing this played out on a daily basis. So it's, it's about trying to get everybody to understand how, how, this, how they are part of this. This isn't, this isn't a phenomenon that's over there that they need to poke around at. It's something that actually most of us can relate to, I would argue all of us, can relate to in some shape or form. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter. We are going to uh, the closing point of this uh, webinar. Thank you for the, all those participants who are still with us. Many interesting questions were asked and not all were answered as yet. And uh, our principle is that all questions will be answered, but not necessarily within this time frame of the session. So we ask all the panelists to look at the questions and to give their answers. Uh, and so we will put that on both the websites of the, the Nederlandse GGZ, the Dutch Mental Health Hub, as well as the site of, uh, of UCOMS, as well as the recording uh, of this. And we, I like to see this as a sort of a community of people in, with interest in public mental health with a specific focus then on trauma. So all your comments, your narratives are very welcome on, on either website. And we, we shared with both that that's what networking really is about. So we want to keep touch with you. As some of you already mentioned, we'd like to hear more of the story of, of Whiskey Mick. And I think there are many narratives around in, in this group. And we like this group to grow. I wish Peter McBride all the success in the world in, in this trip to the, to the, to the USA. 
And um, I really want to thank you. And I want to not to give the, the final words to, uh, to Uda, uh, to Uda Hoyland. You opened about post-traumatic growth, about finding new meanings, uh, building new identities. Uda, what did you learn in the last 90 minutes? Uh, well, I, I'm a bit overwhelmed because this was really interesting. And so uh, I think it's very timely this webinar um, and I could uh, see a lot of the themes reflecting through Peter's uh, talk in the in the interview and for me uh, I got kind of hung up on the um, the thought of uh, creating new narratives and creative uh, creating a new we <laughs> uh, as opposed to us and them and also something Peter said uh, early about um, how if you're very impacted by trauma, uh, you are not remembering things, you are re-experiencing things. And uh, a part of putting things behind you is uh, making the experience into a safe memory. So uh, I'm kind of hung up on how can we make the experiences on a population level into safe memories for all of us and how can we yeah recognize each individual and the different subgroups but also kind of create a new way forward uh but this uh, this is uh, really inspiring and i'm i'm coming back if i'm allowed to <laughs> thank you sure yes of course um yeah Uda, thank you very much for your closing remarks, also very inspiring words. Um, unfortunately, because I also really, really like this webinar and the interaction and the topics and thank you all. Uh, we have to we have to close it off. Uh, I have a little bit of presentation, not presentation, but a thank you uh, to share. Um, Yeah, so we would like to thank you also on behalf of the core team of the Dutch International Mental Health Hub, uh, which René Kate is part of, uh, Wieteke Beernink, uh, Jan Berntse, Margot Overdijk, Beverly Rose, me and Sabine Raams. And of course, thank you very much, Marius Pietersen, who made this all, this all possible. He did all the, the technical organization. So thank you very much. It should not be forgotten. And like I said before, for the people, uh, who would like to join us again, please do so. You're very welcome. The next one is on the 11th of December and the next UCOMS meeting is on the 17th of November. And uh, please feel free to send your comments or remarks or also maybe topics you would like to address uh, with an international perspective. Uh, we, we, were, yeah, we welcome them very much and we can uh, look how to organize this. And before you leave, please don't forget to fill out the survey so that we know how we can improve our uh, webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining and thank you for this very inspiring and uh, yeah, inspiring webinar, giving me at least a lot of uh, new energy. Thank you. And hope to see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>